It's now time to call upon stage Devashish, Bhavdeep and Dyuti from Flipkart. Um, okay, all right, let's begin. Imagine a scenario where a fantasy book lover comes to your website and he's shown or welcomed with the latest and the greatest from the fantasy world. Uh, he is sent a timely notification about the release of Game of Thrones book six. The shipment of the book is sent to him at a point where he's actually free to accept the delivery. When you know your customers, the, the number of things you can do is limitless. So we welcome you to the talk, Know Your Customer. Devashish and I will be your hosts for the next 15 minutes. To begin with, let's try and understand the typical e-commerce experience as it stands today. Most of the online retailers out there drive customer experience by providing a great selection, competitive pricing, ease of discovery, tools to help you decide, so on and so forth. The main takeaway is that majority of these online shopping sites provide a very standard, frictionless, transaction-focused experience to all their users. There is very little differentiation. Uh, is there an opportunity for retailers like Flipkart to actually provide a much superior customer experience and differentiate themselves in, in the process? That question itself leads to something else. Do we truly understand our users? Who are our users? Is every user the same? Do they come with the same intent? Do they spend the same amount of money? The answer is a very clear no. For example, uh, working professionals like all of us spend more time browsing on weekdays and then eventually spend less time browsing on a weekend and make the purchase on the weekend. Customers from northern states, such as Punjab, Haryana, spend 40% more money on a single transaction, at an average, of course, than their southern counterparts. So clearly, every segment is different from every other user segment. They come from different backgrounds, demonstrate different behaviors, and hence have vastly different needs. There is a clear case for experience differentiation. If the end goal is to personalize the experience for your end customer, it becomes very important to understand who your users are. What we've depicted here is the user 360 degree view. To understand who the users are, which is to understand their demographics, to understand what the users like, what they do, is to understand their behavioral, behavioral data. To understand why they do what they do, we, we would look at their attitudinal data and to understand how they choose to interact with various touch points, we would look at their interaction data. So understanding these facets of the user is exactly what the user insights platform, which is how we refer to it internally, was created. The aim is to deeply understand users and create these rich user profiles and segments, which will allow us in turn to provide extremely relevant and personalized experiences to our end customers. So where's the challenge? The issue is not that we don't have enough data about the user. A single user generates a lot of data across various different touch points, indicates different preferences directly and indirectly. However, all of this data is stored separately in independent systems. The first challenge that we tackled was that there was no single view of the user data. The second problem was that of scale. Flipkart now is one of the top 10 visited sites in the country. Millions of users visit us every day. And, and each single user is generating significant data over a period of time. So the scale that we are talking about is hundreds of terabytes of data and billions of rows. Last but not the least is applying intelligence at that scale. Our platform tackles these very problems. So I'll start by explaining the overall flow of the process. So as you explained, we have various data sources, each with its own schema. So the first stage is to transform these into what we call as events. So every action that a user takes becomes an event. If you call to customer support, it will become a call event. If you order something, it will become an order event. Then we transform these into signals. Signals are our intermediate data processing uh, aggregates, which I'll come to in a bit. And the final output of the process is insights. 
Now an insight can be any meaningful information about the user. It can be a transactional fact like the number of orders he has placed or it could be a derived value like gender or the anxiety level of the user. On top of these insights, we build segments. An example of segments would be loyal customers or high price buyers or male users, etc. So the first challenge that we faced was ingestion. Now we have a variety of servers. They're, they're MySQL servers, NoSQL servers, distributed logs, and we have to ingest data from all of these. And each of them has a different schema. So how do we perform this ingestion reliably? How, where do we store the data? How do we represent the data? So what we've basically done is we transform the transactional data and the logs into a unified event stream. And while aggregating this data, we gave it a user pivot. So basically what has happened is if for a user we have all his activity stream, all the data he has generated at a single place. This gives system an events, immense power because any sort of analytics on a user is enabled due to this. For the data store, we used HBase since uh, we need a schemaless data, uh, data store basically because uh, the source data might change and new sources might have to be added. Also HBase is horizontally scalable, I can keep adding more machines, keep adding more data and do not need to worry about partitioning and all that. And it has MapReduce integration, so uh, I can use it to analyze the data. So we basically built an ingestion and transformation framework which is based on uh, ETL, which is extract, transform and load. And we have pluggable components at each stages. So you can add new sources, remove sources and change the transformer. And it also provides checkpointing and resumability in case of failures. Now let me take an end to an example of an insight uh, a simplified version. So suppose we have to compute gender of a user. Now what data points can I use? Uh, people give off their names in addresses and orders. So name can be one signal. We can build a model around predicting a user's gender from his name. People browse uh, the website and males tend to browse differently compared to females. For example, if a user is buying a lot of kurtis, it's likely to be a female buyer. Some people explicitly mention their gender in surveys and uh, user surveys. So we can take them. So these four will become our signals, uh, the intermediate data aggregate. And the important point here is that each signal has pluggable logic and it can be a heuristics or a training model. Then we combine all of these signals to form the final insight. Now how do we make this insight uh, available at real time? Now when the query comes, we obviously cannot perform all of this computation because this data is spanning months. So it will take a lot of time. So the only way to solve it is to pre-process this data. Now, pre-processing this data has to be done for all of the user and in our case it's tens of millions of users. So the overall scale I'm talking about is around billions of rows and terabytes of data. Plus, uh, data is being added daily. So we have to run this job daily. Now there is no way 20 billion rows you can analyze in a day. So you might say MapReduce, but MapReduce will just distribute your algorithm to servers but it won't reduce the algorithmic complexity. So the way to solve this problem is to make the process incremental. So when the new data comes in, we only process that data and somehow combine it with the existing signal that we have. So I process today's data, which gave me that this guy is probably a male with a confidence of say 75% and the existing signal already had 85%. So we can take a weighted average and combine those two. So this way also has some problems like the process is not idempotent and uh, if there are some bugs in the code, it may lead to data getting corrupt, but those all can be solved with an appropriate design. I have uh, mentioned the simple version of signals and insights. So this is the overall logical flow. Uh, we have uh, data which is transformed into events, events into signals and signals finally into insights. We also see a parallel machine learning track over here, uh, which basically is used to train the models which are used by signals. Currently we are building a generic ML framework and we are experimenting with Mahot and MLlib for that. As for the tech stack, we have HBase uh, for most of our uh, as data store and we use YARN which is the new version of MapReduce for performing the data processing and we manage all the workflows using Askaban. So we kind of solve the big data problem by making the process incremental but sometimes you have to run uh, the job on full data that is such a huge amount of data. And when you run jobs at this scale, you need optimizations and tweaks in your code to make it work. So some of the learnings here were, wherever possible, we eliminated the reduce step. Now it, 
in a MapReduce job, it might not be very clear why would you want to remove the reduce step. So the thing is between mappers and reducers, mappers write all their output to disk. Then there is a distributed shuffle and sort happening. And as the data between mappers and reducers uh, increases, this process becomes slow. Plus when the reducer comes up, it reads all of this data into memory and there is a lot of network I.O. involved. Alternatively, if you have your data properly modeled, uh, like user pivot in our case, we can analyze all of that and perform reduce in memory within the mappers itself. It cannot be done every time, but wherever we could, we avoided reducers. For example, when we were training our machine learning models, we had to use reducers, but not while aggregating the features. Another thing was snappy compression in edge base. So uh, we run edge base MR jobs for most of our things. Snappy compression has a very low decompression time and a very good compression ratio. So when you scan the table or start a MapReduce job, it, uh, the disk time, reading time is reduced a lot and the decompression time is not too much. So we got almost 2x increase in MR job performance. We wrote our custom table output format class, which before sending the puts to edge base, buckets them according to region servers and uh, sends them to a specific region server, which gave us a performance increase. Also, we wrote our framework over MRs, which is recoverable MR jobs. Now, jobs do fail at this thing. So this framework is capable of splitting MR jobs into multiple pieces and running each of them. And it can increase the data size and decrease the data size intelligently. Okay, so the next thing is indexing. Now, any one of you who have worked on edge base must have faced this problem at one point of time that indexing over edge base. There are many open source solutions which claim to provide a SQL layer over edge base and take care of the indexing. Uh, but when you're talking about scale like billions of rows, none of, I've seen none of them uh, scale to that level. So what we did was we built our own uh, thing which also had some problems which I'll come to. So the row key of the index table becomes the index value. Suppose I want to change my pivot from user to product. So I'll make product ID the uh, row key of the index table. And in the column qualifiers, I will store the row key of the original table. So basically what will happen is, if you need data around a product, you will query the index table, get where all it is in the main table, and then uh, execute multiple gets on the main table. So you, you, you get reasonable performance. For most of the products, I got uh, sub one second queries, but it won't be enough to run a MR job on that table uh, that way. There are other ways to do that also. And we also built a graph over edge base. We built this graph to form user associations. Now there are many users who browse through different accounts. There are resellers who buy from Flipkart and we have to uh, find them. There are people who use the same account. So uh, the vertices of these graphs were basically users and we formed edges between them based on multiple pivots. Like if they're using the same phone number, there would be an edge linking them. If they use the same address, there will be an edge linking them. And we currently use this to identify similar accounts uh, there. And this graph is implemented as a adjacency list over edge base, but we are exploring graph DBs right now. So this is the basically what we have built till now. We are able to create rich user profile. We are able to analyze all of the data in an incremental fashion. And we have built it as a platform. So there's pluggable piece of code at each place. We don't want to limit ourselves to okay, gender or category affinity or price affinity. We are instead building a platform which can people can plug in their code and do it. But if you ask for the future, there's a lot we can still do. We are currently working on a generic ML platform for training. As I said, uh, experimenting with Mahat and ML Lib. We want to perform unsupervised clustering of users uh, rather than saying urban users, we want to apply k-means and unsupervisedly cluster them. Uh, interactive querying of data. Now the speed with which analysts can query uh, the data, it's currently very slow. If you run hive queries, it will take a lot of time. So we are exploring technologies like Dremel, Phoenix, and Impala. Another thing that we want to do is change, like we have built this system on a user pivot whole throughout. But if we are able to change the user pivot to a product pivot, we might be able to generate product insights using our same framework. So that is also what we can explore. Okay, that's it. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Spark, uh, we are right now working on it. We have Yarn which is compatible with it, but uh, till now we haven't done it. I mean, we're in process of it.
please direct your questions uh, use the twitter hashtag and please post your questions there we have to move on to the next flash talk flash talk how about uh, the affinity of user groups to product of to product of group so or product or product groups so are you also going to do the mapping of affinities of certain kinds of users to yeah, certain so kinds of products yeah so we working on things like category affinity but the basic uh, we have solved this problem by keeping it a user pivoted thing 